Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, I'm here with Naomi, my co-host, and today we're very pleased to have as our special guest, John, who will be um, helping us explore this topic. And tonight's topic, we're going to be talking about how causality makes free will impossible. Okay, I want to start this show with um, the basic, the first statement on causality in the Western world. It came through the Greek philosopher Leucippus in um, about 5, 5 BC, and um, the 5th century BC rather, and um, basically his, his statement was that nothing happens at random but everything for a reason and by necessity. Okay, that's the first historic statement on causality or cause and effect determining everything. So Nomi, Nomi, can you can you describe to to our audience what how causality is the basic process of, of change in our universe? Yes, thank you, George. Uh, the way I understand causality is that when we are in 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 a time and space world, uh, the the temporal sequence of events is such that uh, certain necessary and sufficient causes have to be there before we can see the effect, and which the evidence for that is so. Uh, widespread in in every scientific endeavor uh, that it's it's totally impossible to deny that cause and effect uh, do work. Uh, we base our research on on the notion that this universe is causal, uh, but we also have to uh, recognize that there are levels of reality. The causal map that we have of um, the physical uh, dimension that might be different from the causal map we will have of the semantic. Uh, where the meaning comes in, like when we move from electrons and protons and neutrons uh, to thought processes, to how societies and groups think, uh, the, all the causal maps will uh, be different from from moving from physics to chemistry to biology to psychology uh, a, and to spirituality. Uh, John? Well, that's I'm very curious about that. Um, if you just think about the physical world and how the instruments that we use um, studying subatomic particles, mm -hmm. what is the neutron microscope, right? right? And then we study vast interstellar spaces with our uh, the Hubble telescope. Mm -hmm. um, and we gather information from these instruments which sort of mimic our visual system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we create maps. Right. Um, but many of these maps contradict even at the physical level, the very large and the very small mm -hmm. uh, seem to have different rules or habits. So I was wondering if um, when we get to the psychological and the social level, um, since we haven't unified physics yet, or maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> <laughs> maybe they have, I just don't know about it, but wouldn't it be, uh, don't we have a long way to go before we unify um, the, the psychological? Okay. While there are various maps of understanding various phenomena like thoughts and physical entities, um, the point though is that regardless of what those maps are studying, um, the events that they're studying, whether they're physical behavior or human, human behavior, whatever it is, it's all causal. So, so, it, so the, the, the map, the kind of perspective we bring into it is really inconsequential because the underlying process, and that's, that's the key, like causality is the basic, the basic process of change in the universe, John. I mean, without causality, nothing would happen. Without, without causality, there would be no change in the universe. But isn't that just another map? Um, it's... It's a map so fundamental. In other words, like um, gravity, you know, um, within the map of, 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 of physical science, of physics, gravity has been so established that certainly we could, we could say that it's based on a map of physics and there are other maps, but it has never been refuted and it's so, so conclusive. And this, this um, process of cause and effect is so fundamental to change that yes it is an, a map but is it is the map it is the map um, under which no other map could could operate because it's the map responsible for for any manner of change in the universe well I'm just curious about the map maker who makes the map 
Mm -hmm. and it does seem to me that every observation is made by somebody. Um, and so I think that's a crucial thing we include in the mix. Because you may yeah. be telling us that, you know, the map maker's part of the illusion. Am I wrong about that? Or? Okay, that's a very good question. The, when, in the map maker, maker, I think in this, um, I think you're asking, well, how do we determine what's our, what are our principles, our guiding principles for determining the truth of, of you right. know, this causality? And um, we have, for this, we have, my God, this is so fundamental. Um, regard, we, we're in a reality where things happen, you know, where, and, and the most fundamental nature of reality is that everything is matter, or if you want to, you know, um, bring in spirituality, everything is matter and spirit, perhaps moving or, or acting within time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so what happens is, okay, we can claim, I mean, um, we, can, we can understand that as subjective beings, as human beings, even as a human race, even as a planet, that because we are subjective, because we're not the whole universe, we can only guess at this. this you know, we can only guess. We can like take our best guess based on, on the available evidence. So while certainly um, we, we can leave the notion open that, um, that we're wrong, um, every, every scientific body of evidence, every empirical body of evidence, everything that we, um, that we have access to um, leads us to this conclusion of causality, again, being the basic process of change. That's, you know, um, and that, that's, but that's how powerful it is. That's how powerful the process is, you know, in, in, in our human will as well as in our, um, you know, physical reality. It's a very important question because we, we do have um, evidence from the history of science that we have the Newtonian understanding of the world, where, and then we had Einsteinian theory of relativity. So when you when you compare two models, uh, Newtons won't work at extremely high speeds or extremely small sizes. So there was something going on in reality which we did not have a model for, and Einstein came up with this theory, uh, which explained it. So therefore. It didn't mean that Newton's map was wrong. It was just not applicable at certain levels of reality. And therefore, we need both. So there are two maps, and there are two map makers. Uh, both are having a dialogue with reality. And one is discovering a certain dimension, certain aspect of it. Another is discovering another one. And ultimately, they can be integrated. OK. <coughs> um, let's say we were to discuss the question, um, does reality exist? Go okay, ahead. this is my <laughs> hand. <start. laughs> Does reality? No, no. So, because like, because we could bring this question up. Because like, then we're, we're we could say to ourselves, well, does reality exist? Well, what map are you basing this on? And maybe right. there's different maps. Now we have to we have to conclude. We have to agree that reality does exist, right? So regardless of what map, that there is a fundamental understanding that that we agree upon that reality exists. So so it's that part of this reality. The reality we understand is that things happen. That's our reality. Mm -hmm. We're just like, we're human beings, we're, we're physical entities that are perceiving things happen, that are doing things, that everything, everything we perceive is happening. Mm -hmm. And that, that, the things happen, the things change, that again is the universal statement of causality. Whereas like, you know, and, and I say that to, to, to mean that like, if there are fundamental realities aspects of reality that are um, that we can't do without like that reality exists you know if reality exists then um, there has to be a process that allows for reality to change from one moment to the next mm -hmm. and naturally if, if reality is not static which we know it's not um, then we have to understand that change as coming about through a certain process and that's where causality comes in. That's, that's why it's so fundamental. So we, uh, as embodied beings, we're aware of things happening. Um, we're aware of parts, and we're intuiting the whole, which is invisible, really. That's where you were talking about spirituality. 
and matter, and maybe they're just uh, different aspects of one universe. But it does seem to me we human beings are very addicted to the, the thingness of this world and the partness of it. Yet, you know, there's a lot of it that we, you know, there's a vast background that we're responding to sometimes. Uh, but like when we do meditation, we may drop the uh, external physical thing stuff and just uh, rest in that. Um, so I think the, uh, the idea of what's uh, real and what exists becomes a bit of a blur when you're dealing with those uh, very expanded states of consciousness. So I'm wondering, uh, but I'm perfectly willing to, you know, no, keep, well, keep myself open, but not too open. No, no, that's good. Because so I want to stay focused on this topic right, and right. How, how this fits in. If it does fit in. Uh, no, that's good. In my understanding, I think science and spirituality are, are not uh, different. There are aspects of the universe, and I think both can be understood uh, with the help of reason. Uh, when you, I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of integral approach uh, developed by American philosopher Ken Wilber. Uh, I'm a student of his work, so I, it's still evolving. Uh, but I do understand that humans do have uh, complex states of consciousness. And when, when you mentioned meditation, uh, we are accessing uh, some, of, some of those states of consciousness which perhaps give us different uh, understanding of the universe. And I think they should be a part of the bigger picture that we will have eventually of the way the universe is. So Wilbur is one of those pioneers who looks at the different maps yeah. from different traditions. Yeah, and I think integration of science and spirituality is possible. And let's let's take because um, basically you're you're bringing up the um, the possibility of there being a spiritual world that that everything is not material, as as kind of like um, a factor that 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 um, that affects this this understanding of causality as the basic process of change. But but consider this. Um, let's say you have a spiritual event. Okay, spiritual meeting meaning of course, that it's not material. And, and again, to my, um, I happen to be a materialist personally. I believe that everything's matter, and what we define as spiritual is that matter, which we, we don't have the instrumentation or ability to perceive you know, in, in any way. So we say, you know, we can't see it, it must be spiritual. But the important point here is that causality describes events, how, how something changes from one moment to the next in cause, cause and effect manner. So, so just as every physical particle, physical event must have a cause, then so every spiritual event, everything spiritual that happens must also have a cause. Otherwise then we would, um, we would have to say that, well, a spiritual thing just comes into being of its own. And then we, we would be, I, I think, at a loss to explain how that could happen, how, how a spiritual event could be somehow uncaused. So when, when we are meditating, we are creating a necessary causality uh, to experience what we call the spiritual, or if you call it you know, another aspect of matter, uh, I'd be fine with that. But we are still respecting causality, otherwise why would we meditate? Or why would we like to have a mushroom before we can access a different state of consciousness? We, we respect the causal necessity, even if we have to have an exp have a spiritual experience. Would you like to add? Yeah, to John. That? Well, I'm a, I'm a, a total beginner here. Okay, <laughs> um, trying to maintain my beginner's mind, which isn't that hard, because <laughs> this is very complicated. But maybe you could help me out with this, because when you meditate and you drop the, uh, the external um, and uh, dissolve into that openness, it seems to me um, we're moving from the symmetrical to the asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Can, yeah, you know it's, what I'm it's an interesting about? attribute. <laughs> yeah, and how as we go back and forth from this to that openness, openness, emptiness, um, as we have the experiences of that moving back and forth, we bring some of that openness with us into this physical world. And I re respect that you're a materialist, and um, I'm not necessarily a materialist, but I'm not an idealist either. So I think there's this uh, in-between, this uh, excluded middle 
um, that we need to bring back. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think our Western tendency is to um, exclude the middle, to maintain our identities. And uh, so it's either this or it's that. And we forget entirely that it can be both and, and neither nor, mm -hmm. which I think comes out of a, more of an of a Eastern orientation than a Western. But since we're in this great age of, of, of uh, sort of merger between East and West, I think this is something that uh, many of us in the West are feeling more and more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. This middle, this excluded middle, we want to include that in, in what's going on. All right. I, I, you know, I, I meditate a lot, you know, I must have made it, meditated for several hours at least yesterday, and I'm, I'm familiar with, like, you know, some of the Buddhist traditions related to, um, to understanding reality, and, um, but, I mean, w is what you're saying, all right, now, in terms of, like, something, let's say, being there or not, and again, we, we went um, through this before in the last episode, Whereas um, in Buddhism, there is a conventional reality and an absolute reality mm -hmm. that conventionally um, we, we believe we have an ego or a self, but in actuality, you know, the absolute truth is that, that we're all one. We're all part of just one. We're, there is no separate I or, or us. We're just, we're, there is only one. So, but, but in a different sense, okay, like for example, that in front of us is a table, okay, and we can, we can um, say that, well, it both exists and it doesn't exist. We, we can say that, but within both a, a Western and an Eastern, really, um, perspective, we have to, um, um, we have to choose. We choose. That's, I mean, even, even um, among Buddhists, um, um, holders of the belief that the things are and are not at the same time they um right. they operate among al along the the conventional um understanding that um that things are right that the form and formless is a, a unity right there's a unity there right and then then i guess that brings up the question well let's say you know, to, to explore this, you know, it's most absolute. Let's say something both is and isn't at once. Um, again, to my mind, I'm, I, I'm not sure I can understand how that could be unless we apply a different definition to something being and to something not being. But, but let's, say, let's say the reality, the absolute reality, is that some things both are and are not. At okay, the which, quantum level, maybe. <laughs> which is what you're saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but then, are we going to say then that what is not is completely static and without change? Because if, if, if what is not um, is completely static, then it, it seems somewhat inconsequential to, to, to everything else. If it, if it doesn't move, it doesn't influence or affect. So, so then, then the question becomes, well, if, if what does not exist also changes, it has to change, you know, w with time, or if what does not exist has to exist within time, then wouldn't that also have to be causal? Mm -hmm. John? Well, what about the, um, the concept of zero in mathematics? Now, I'm not a mathematician, you are, but uh, you have to have the zero. You can have real numbers and imaginary numbers and, and all of them have a relationship to zero, um, but what is zero? It's nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if that fits at all in what you're talking about. All right. Um, well, let, let's let's examine the, the concept of zero because the concept of zero. Let's say if you take um, five plus zero to equal zero, or, I mean five rather, um, then well, no, that that's not a good good example. Um, Okay, zero. What, what I'm trying to do is apply um, the, the the concept of zero within the causal perspective. Right. Um, Just as the absolute is analogous to zero in mathematics, uh, we 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 can move back and forth without privileging either, either one, and that's what I understand very advanced practice is about: that form and formlessness 
are a necessary unity. Mm -hmm. So we can... But we do understand that nobody understands consciousness. I right. mean, we talk to any neuroscientist or psychologist, they are not sure how the brain processes create this consciousness or perhaps consciousness is a separate entity altogether. This debate right. is very much open and I think it does have um, relevance to states of consciousness. If you're discussing consciousness, uh, we have to understand what is the nature of it. Right. And nobody knows at this point. Right. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, we're talking about free will. And, and I think it has relevance. What does that mean with this as a background? But do you think it has relevance to this question of free will? What is human consciousness? What are different states within that consciousness? Um, well, yeah, I think there is. I'm not quite prepared to go into that, though. I would, I would. Yeah, uh, no, I, I want to stay with. The, yeah, no, you're right. Cause that, is, that is, a, you know, we're, we're going to have to explore that. We're absolutely going to have to explore that on on another episode. But it, it is very complicated. Um, it's complex, and a lot of it will have to depend on how we're defining consciousness. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you can't sort of escape it, even exactly. though it's the thing that everyone wants to avoid. Because right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, who could possibly does the brain cause that? Is it just epiphenomena, a a byproduct of mm -hmm. uh, biochemistry? Uh, I doubt that. I'm of the persuasion that um, uh, it's, uh, there is consciousness that is content-free, mm -hmm. um, analogous to a zero in mathematics. I, I want to get back to the but zero. That's not where we live our, our relative lives, where we're making choices every day. And uh, with that, what you're saying is a, an illusion that we have free will and that we're making those choices. Right. Um, I, would, I would bring in that, that there's unconscious and a conscious mind, which is very fluid and very open and, and shifting constantly depending mm -hmm. on the environment we're in, the people we're with. So I wouldn't be too, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm much, much more open about it as something that's very fluid mm -hmm. rather okay, than either this or that, or either have free will or you're it's all de predetermined. I think it's, once again, I'm attracted to that middle ground. Right, but I mean, you're bringing up the, the concept of, of zero as, as, a, um, as perhaps lending an opening to free will. Um, but in mathematics, because zero seems a mathematical um, you know, um, construct, concept, um, zero has rel relevance. In other words, you know, you put a five um, on paper, it means five. You put five and a zero after it, it means 50. So, so basically, right. it's, it's a symbol. It's a symbol that, you know, um, sometimes it's like um, des um, based on the decimal system, I guess, you know, that um, more zeros, the more, um, more that, um, you know, 10, 100, 1,000, whatever. But, but then, again, one would have to, like, kind of, like, explain how um, zero would somehow um, circumvent causality. You know, how, how could the concept of zero, you know, for example, uh, circumvent even the invention of zero uh, or, or the discovery of zero as a concept? Zero does represent uh, a certain state in, within reality. We have developed mathematics uh, with the help of zero. And without that concept, the way we understand mathematics, it, it would not have been possible. So there are states within reality which need that. And, but when we are going from uh, states of consciousness where we experience emptiness, uh, that to me is, is, is more complex. Uh, and it, it is happening within our awareness that we are aware of some nothingness, some emptiness. Right, like deep sleep, or except right, you're not sleep. asleep. Right. You're, if you're meditating, you may be sitting in a lotus pose or on a pillow or right. something like that. Right. So you're aware of a, a pure, content-free awareness, right. which is most people feel is very blissful. But then you come back into the world of traffic jams and, Ones and zeros. long lines <laughs> at the bank and things like that. Yeah, so right. it's a and right. different things. Mm -hmm. uh, yet there's a, a sense of uh, this comes, uh, this is connected to um, this space mm -hmm. that's empty and can't be characterized in any reasonable way. And of course, a lot of people just avoid 
the whole topic entirely. And I think that's what a lot of neuroscientists have done. Have just said, oh, it's just, you know, consciousness is just an epiphenomena. Uh, and I think you've used that word a, a couple of times. And uh, I'm just uh, fascinated by the interplay between cognitive science and psychology, uh, because there are a lot of people who are claiming there's just neuroscience. And I'm of the persuasion that uh, without psychology, neuroscience is just neuroscience. It's just looking at neurons and mm -hmm. the, their activity. Um, but I think psychology um, gives you the theory of mind that allows you to actually create experiments that make the neuroscience uh, informative to us. Yes, and the crucial point, I think, in our discussion is that um, you have the neurophysiology underlying all psychological behavior. Can you go into that more? Because uh, well, sure. Because like basically, the mind is is a um, the brain is a physical entity in our nervous system. Everything that 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 evokes and creates um, change, that creates you know psychological actions has its basis, must have its basis um, on the, the functional, I need to see the clock guys, um, has the, the functional, um, I, I guess we have about 40 seconds left. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Um, basically, yeah, th um, there, could, there can be no psychology without the, the physical apparatus of the neuro, as, le as far as we know, of, of um, of the neuroscience, of neuro neurophysiology. But the important point is that, that both seem causal. All right, we, this, we've got to talk about this a lot more, but we've got like a few seconds left. And uh, Nomi, John, thank you so much for an excellent, we are, we are getting into this. This is good. This is very good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll be back with, with other episodes uh, very soon. Thanks. Thank you.